What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Seems to be a ritual, right? Every time I start a new live feed or podcast, whatever you want to call it, I um, have to take a big swig of water. The intent behind that is to uh, keep my redox potential up to help my mitochondria because this is a fairly stressful process. Um, most of the time, I usually have this thing hooked up to, um, to a landline connection, so I'm not uh, absorbing too many uh, non-native uh, electromagnetic frequencies, but um, yeah. Anyway, I'm going to get into this discussion of uh, differential advantage. I have a small list here of things that I'm going to want to cover with this. Um, if you are a person seeking to be in functional patterns, this will probably be some kind of a, this will be required. <clears throat> Do you guys understand where I'm coming from? Uh, what I'm trying to tackle, what I'm trying to accomplish, and what the obstacles are in terms of me uh, overcoming um the, over overcoming of really the, the fundamental problems that impede us from moving into a type one civilization about what the hell was it? It was, I think it was 2008 when I watched Zeitgeist Adenum. I had watched Zeitgeist, uh, the original, I think it was in 2007. Um, I watched the Adenum, I think the following year, I think it was 2008 when uh, Peter Joseph made Zeitgeist Adenum. Uh, and it was after that that I kind of uh, it kind of solidified my purpose based upon what I had seen from Jacques Fresco and Peter Joseph. I, I the, the way that Peter Joseph described um, learning about Jacques Fresco is that, you know, you kind of always had like a certain vision of the world and you could kind of understand what was going on around you. But what Jacques Fresco did is he kind of took the lens and he made everything really clear so you could see things much more clearly. Now, how clearly can you see those things? only so far. And Jock kind of, if you follow Jock Fresco principles, you'll see that it, it's not necessarily that he, he teaches you to see everything. He just teaches you like what to see, to understand how limited you are and, and to kind of like technically be able to understand how to do it. Like he, he kind of teaches you the paradox of what living actually is and what are, what, a, what, a, what part of our experience is quantifiable and which part of it isn't quantifiable and uh, how testing is ultimately going to determine where we end up going as a species. And so um, one of the things that Jock Fresco uh, talks about a lot, and he talks about many different things, um, was differential advantage. He would bring that up. He brought that up. I believe, I'm not sure if Peter Joseph had really fully, uh, if he had learned that uh, the dangers of differential advantage from Jock Fresco or not. I'm not entirely certain, but... Um, what I do know is that he brought this up in the Zeitgeist Addendum movie, and I thought it was a really, uh, it was a really fascinating topic. Uh, the reason that we need to understand that what differential advantage is it comes back to our own personal biases, our own personal uh, foibles in life, and, and in general, our interactions with other people. There's always driving forces behind our behavior. There's always something driving our behavior. There's, and it's never you, it's never, okay. It's me. That's making the decisions in my life. There's always something externally going on that influences your behavior. Like gravity on a regular basis is influencing your behavior and you're having to adapt to gravity in a particular fashion, um, to, you know, navigate this world. Uh, if gravity changed, if we had the moon, moon's gravity, we would all feel very different. We'd probably feel ill after a while because, you know, our organs, our bodies, our muscles, are adapted to uh, gravity on earth. And so at some point, if, uh, if gravitational force was to change on planet earth at some point, it would probably impact our behavior in some way. If, um, if more solar thunders or solar storms or whatever you call them, or solar flares began happening, that would influence our behavior greatly as well. Um, we could have more droughts. We could have a whole assortment of different climate changes that would modify our behavior. Uh, our behavior is environmentally determined. Like we don't really, we don't really determine the how we um how we feel throughout the day you can't really you can do things to help you find more consistency in terms of how you're going to feel about yourself and your day and even how you're going to feel with your your interactions with people there's mechanisms that you can institute that you'll learn on this podcast uh to help you do that but the truth is you can never really predict what what's going to go on in reality and you can't really ever you can't control everything you have to understand that at some point you're going to be a victim of, of unpredictable circumstances. For example, if I'm looking out at the trees right now, I don't know in what direction 
like I'm looking at, at the, like there, there's a fairly strong wind outside right now and I'm looking at the branches and I can't really tell which branch is going to move first. I can kind of guess what segment of the branches are going to move first, but I can't tell you what specific leaf is going to move first, what specific molecule on that leaf is, is going to move first. Like I don't understand any of that. I, I, I can, I can get a general idea of what's going on with reality and, um, and, and make my calculations based upon what I know. But the truth is I'm never really going to understand what's going on. You can predict things. You can predict patterns in nature. You can predict all sorts of different things, but to the degree of what you're going to predict that is, is, uh, is subject to the, to the sensors that are present on your body, which is what I want to go into as well, is that we have sensors on our bodies. We're essentially robots to some degree. And our sensors dictate uh, sensors dictate where we're at in space based upon the stimuli that's provided around us. So if I have, if for example, for example, if I I don't have from what I understand, I don't have anything to detect antimatter. Maybe I do. Somebody could tell me otherwise, but I don't have anything to detect that. But I do have things that help me detect light. You know, I have my you know my some light receptors probably on my skin. I have a uh, light receptors that are my eyeballs, right? So I can sense things that I can, uh, I can sense light to some degree, um, just based upon looking at things, right? Um, all, I think all things that I see, what is it? It's reflected light that I'm looking at apparently. But anyway, uh, I can sense things. Uh, I have certain sensors that enable me to hear things, right? I have a proprioceptive. I have a sense of uh, appetite suppression right or i have a sense of appetite we have senses of all sorts of different things we have i have a sense of anxiety all the time uh just based upon what the hell is going on with our world um i i have senses of all sorts of things right we feel things out but there's some things that you just can't sense as much as i i unless i have a microscope unless a microscope scope is, is another sensor right? It's another sense that we add to ourselves to look at things that are really, really small. A telescope is a, a sensor that enables us to see things that are really far out. Um, we have, we create sensors. This is one thing that's really interesting about human beings is that we use this thing called technology uh, to enable us to sense more things. Technology gives us more senses uh, altogether, right? We, we like, we understand more things about deep space now because we create tele we've created telescopes. So with that said, um, Jacques Fresco kind of has given me that, that way of understanding the world. And, I, and it's not just that I can't, I can imagine that other people have probably taught things similar. I just don't think everybody's put it together quite like him. And there's something that he, that something else that he goes into substantially where he talks about uh, this is what, what I was going on about was that human behavior is forced. In some de to some degree, you don't really make your decisions in some way, shape or form. You're always having something impact your decisions, whether that's gravity, whether that's advertising, whether that's religion, uh, whether it's the way that you use language, the type of language that you were taught, uh, the culture that you were brought up in. There's a whole assortment of different things that impact your behavior. So you don't really there's this idea of free will and uh and self-imposed meaning are, are kind of irrelevant when you want be, really begin to understand the deeper mechanisms of biology and just in general, some aspects of physics. I don't understand everything. I realize I'm flawed. I realize my perceptions are limited. I understand that, but I genuinely feel that way. Uh, I genuinely feel that way and I try to live that way. So I'm, so I'm always learning and I'm always doing whatever I can to be of service to you guys. So then uh, in turn, you guys will help me in some way. This is called a reciprocity. It's thinking uh, in terms of, uh, of reciprocity. Um, this, is how, this is how humans have lived for fucking ever. This is how biological organisms have existed forever. So at the end of the day, what I'm trying to, um, to promote on my end is, uh, is this, this concept of reciprocity. It's almost maybe a step down from what would Jock Fresco would describe as extensionality. But I think in some, to some degree, it's, it's the same thing that at, at the end of the day, we are um, on this planet together, we're sharing it. And at some point we all have to find out a common code of conduct so we can get along better as a species. And I think this little uh, talk about differential advantage is going to be important because it's going to dig in really deep as to uh, the mechanisms that are present in all of us. Uh, that drive our personal bias. And most importantly, what differential, differential advantage is going to reveal is the personal strategy that we use to get by in life.
to try and get what we want out of life, which at the end of the day, everybody wants an easier life. When a person buys a nice car, the reason they buy a nice car most of the time from what, from my perspective is that they want people to like them. And if people like them, they'll have more friends. And if they have more friends, they'll have more, they'll feel more pro protected. Um, they'll have, uh, you know, all sorts of different opportunities in terms of business pop up and whatnot. Um, that's the way they feel about it. It's a particular strategy. If somebody buys a car, um, that's their, their car in relation to everybody else in their community is their differential advantage. They're like, Oh, look at me. I have a car. And so because of that, you want it. And it's a really nice car. Now you can see how I'm going to be more relevant because this car, uh, makes me, I guess, in some way, shape or form, uh, more attractive to other people. And now, um, now I'm, I want, now I'm, I'm going to be, you know, the person you want to be around. And then now we can build this hype up about how cool I am because I have this car. Um, that's like an example of a, of a form of a, of differential advantage. Going back to what I was, what I was, uh, going back to th this general topic at hand, it's going to get in really deep. It's going to get in really deep because you're going to start to ask yourself how much of you, uh, is really you and how much of you is just a strategy built upon the biological mechanisms, uh, that of which you're for one, trying to survive. And two, you're trying to duplicate, um, my, my perspective on, on, uh, on biological mechanisms at fundamental biological mechanisms are that everything stems, uh, from survivalistic mechanisms that we, we aim to survive number one. And I, so if you look at, uh, the mechanism of biology, if you listen to somebody like, I mean, this is, I think widely accepted at this point in terms of, uh, from what biologists understand is that what drives most organisms or all organisms from all life systems is, uh, for one is one of the survive. And the second is duplication. And I feel that duplication itself is just a, simply an extension of, um, that duplication by itself is an extension of, uh, of looking to survive uh, indefinitely to survive forever, to, to not die. So with that said, everything is a survival mechanism. When you use differential advantage, it's, it's your strategy for better survival uh, mechanisms. Does the pursuit of differential, does necessarily every strategy work? Obviously not. If we look at uh, people in our, in our society, we have people that are, that we would classify as losers and winners, right? Is anybody really a winner if somebody loses? No. Nobody wins if we have uh, losers in society. And uh, we all lose if we have losers in society. That's my personal take on it. Um, that said, can I help everybody? No, we can't all help everybody. We look at homeless people all the time and we let them lose on a regular basis. But we all, in some ways, shape or form, uh, we we own that uh, that loss to some degree. Um, damn, I'm I'm losing my train of thought here, guys. But anyway, uh, I'm, I'm gonna. This is a tough thing to describe. This is a difficult thing to describe, and I'm gonna get really raw about a lot of things. I'm gonna have to get really raw about a lot of things. So, um, going back, I'm gonna I'm, and I have my notes here just to kind of like um, to to orient me. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna move into the next topic here. Um, is differential advantage always a bad thing? Not necessarily. And I'll tell you guys how it's not necessarily a bad thing. If I come in, let's say if, if I'm Elon Musk, Elon Musk has differential. He uses differential advantages all the time to promote his company. And what's his differential advantage? Um, and, and keep in mind, what is differential advantage? It's, it's, again, it's, it's as a concept, it's your strategy towards showcasing that you're uh, that you're still important in the eyes of other people. It's kind of, it's your, 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 the way that you use things like, for example, like a uh, Jock Fresco uses this as an example. If you have, um, if you have, you know, two lamp uh, uh, stores or whatever, you have one lamp store that's been there for, you know, 30 years. And then somebody says, you know what, I want to start selling lamps too. Uh, but let's say the new store has way better lamps the person in the old lamp store isn't going to concede and say, well, his lamps are better than mine. My amps are equally good to his, uh, even if his lamps aren't good. Why? Because he has mechanisms within his biology that tell him, dude, you need to survive and you need to, you need to justify your actions in any way, shape or form to uh, keep your, this lamp store alive. Because if you, if this lamp store dies, you die and we're fucked. So 
that's kind of an applied uh, sense of, uh, of differential advantage that in many circumstances would lead to people getting crappy lamps. Um, and this is how our society works. Uh, if you look at, for example, the fossil fuel industry, which will kind of tr transition us back to uh, Tesla. If you look at the fossil fuel industry, clearly there are internal mechanisms in the fossil fuel industry that lead to, um, how would I put it? There, there, are, there are mechanisms in the owners of these fossil fuel companies to stifle innovation uh, in order to, uh, to for, for them to keep making money so they can fulfill uh, their bio, what they assume is their biological need. Uh, their cells to some degree are telling them, hey, this is the strategy. Their differential advantage is telling them this is the strategy we're going to employ to keep ourselves alive and pass on our genes to our kids. So our genes can stay alive, right? This is the the strategy that people are going to employ, that these people are going to employ. Um, and in that regard, that's where differential advantage is a damaging thing. When it's a good thing is when you have somebody like Elon Musk who's saying, you know what? Uh, there's technology is good, but the problem is that there's always a negative externality that comes with all forms of technology. So if this um, if if this uh, idea is is adopted fully we might arrive at a type one civilization where we will end up being sustainable uh we we will be kind of unified with nature and uh you know people will be a lot he healthier and happier overall if we get our shit together and what elon musk in general is routinely working on is trying to bridge that gap so we can become a more functional society that's what he's trying to do and his differential advantage is look I don't use fossil fuels. My cars are really cool. They drive really fast. You get all the same things as a luxury vehicle. Uh, even they're even uh, they're even quicker. Maybe not faster in the long haul, but in, in terms of a long distance speed. But they're still they're really cool cars. They drive themselves. Uh, they have amazing autopilot features because of X, Y, and Z, whatever. You'll give every explanation. Plus, it's actually more sustainable. So you get every aspect of. Uh, of, uh, of what you want in our culture, plus you get this big perk of, of damaging the environment a whole lot less. So his differential advantage is built upon streamlining functionality. So in that regard, uh, Elon Musk's perspectives on business are really, really good. Before I started my company, Functional Patterns, I had this idea in my head. I thought about it for a long time. I, a while back, I made these things called medicine bricks. Um, they're patent pending. I don't even know if they are anymore. I, I spent a lot of money, the little money that I had back in the day, I spent it on trying to make these damn things. And truthfully, it was a con job. At some point I was like, you know, what? I can, I was really creative and I can make exercises with all sorts of tools. And I was like, you know what? I'll make, uh, exercises with these tools. It was two like blocks and I brought them together. Watch, you might see somebody fucking make these things now and maybe, uh, patent them and then try and make money off of it. You never know. Uh, but anyway, I had these two medicine bricks and uh, yeah, I would bring them together. It would work your pecs. You do like chop. We do all sorts of different things. And there were some aspects that were kind of cool. The fact that you had to keep the, the, the bricks together to do the motions themselves kind of added a different uh, stimuli into uh, into the, the, the mix when you started swinging them around and whatnot. So at some points it was good. And then there was also like you could do push-ups on them and whatnot. I was pretty much trying to sell uh, a piece of crap. And so... I was, uh, I, I learned after some time, I, I, it was maybe about a year later and I was still kind of working on this. And I watched this, uh, this documentary from, from, uh, Zeitgeist. And I was like, what am I trying to do here? I, I had to, at some point say, what am I trying to do here? Is this, am, am I just trying to find a reason, give people reasons to buy my shady product? Is it really that great? What's it really doing? What's it really accomplishing? Is it really that much better than a dumbbell? And as I started thinking about it more and more, I'm like, no, you can do everything that you're doing right now with the, with the dumbbell that's blocked. You could do the exact same shit. It would be no different. Um, you could do everything that you can with either a dumbbell or a medicine ball. The only difference is that you can't, like if you if you compare what these medicine bricks were in comparison to a medicine ball is that you can throw a ball. It's easier to catch a sphere than a, than a, than a blocked object. So you can't throw the things. Uh, they'll chip or they'll break on the sides if you do that. So I started saying, well, why the hell did I even make that? And I was like, oh, damn, you're a victim of, you know, wanting to maintain your position of differential advantage. Shit. So what are you left over to do now? Become a legitimate person. And for the longest time, guys, I, I thought like most other people, I wanted a shortcut out of life. And um, some things I regret. And uh, 
but at least I kind of get to share my ideas. And if I fucking whatever, I don't know, maybe when I'm on my deathbed or whatever, or when fucking somebody kills me or some shit, uh, maybe at that point I'll be like, you know what? At least I lived. At least, at least I didn't. I, I lived at least somewhat of an honest life. At least I lived honest enough within my perceptions to say, you know what? You did the right things, Naudi. Like I, I, I could say that. But anyway, I, I was, I was. Th there's things that I regret about my life. Obviously, I think every, I, I think anybody who tells you they, they they don't regret certain things out of their life, I don't think they were, I don't think they're being that honest with themselves. But anyway, in the process of doing everything that I have, I um, I, I had to reevaluate so much of what I was doing. Uh, to come to the understanding that I was, um, I was just compensating. I was, I was look, simply just looking to, uh, to try and con my way out of everything, to not have to work, to not build a foundation for myself, to not build a foundation of competence. I thought maybe I'll just cheat my way through this shit. Maybe I'll just fake it and then make it. Um, and I think to some degree I, I did, I think almost everybody does, man, because we don't really ever know what the hell we're doing. So that whole idea of faking it till you make it, I think everybody's going to take part in that because you're always in the process of trying things. You're always experimenting with things. And as you get older, you begin to find out what experiments, uh, worked and which ones didn't work. And then you become more successful in life. But at some point you have to experiment and you have to, and what I've tried to do in terms of like, after I watched this documentary is I was like, okay, well, what about what I'm doing is, is useful and what about it is fucking fraudulent? What's that, what part of it is simply just making me money and what part, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with making money. Um, but what part of it is, is just me trying to make money and which part of it is me uh, actually trying to earn my money, earn my position, earn the, the living that I'm making. Cause I, I personally don't feel that it's, there's a problem with you making money as long as you're earning your money. There's no, there's nothing wrong with, with, with earning money. If it's being earned, I think if everybody lived within the confines of saying that I'm really actually earning my money, contributing to society, that we would be in a much better world now. Um, but then at that point we have to dictate to what, what does it really mean to earn your money? What are you really contributing? I think it just comes down to how many negative externalities you are promoting with your, with whatever it is that you're selling. Um, like what's what's the what are the remainders on what your quote unquote help is for people? That's the question that I ask. And um, with that said, my, my objective at some point within time, understanding what, how I got sucked in with me trying to make my bogus bullshit invention, um, I, I realized, you know, um, that I need to orient my thoughts to things that are actually going to help people. Because if I'm going to play in the business world, I actually have to quantifiably help people. It has to be quantifiable. Um, is Elon Musk quantifiably helping people? Yes, he can quantify it. I guarantee you he can put it into numerical data. Uh, can I quantify what I'm doing? I'm working on that. I think I'm getting close. You guys can see the results. If you see somebody kind of walking with a neurological impairment and then on a before video and you see them walking without that neurological impairment, then at, the, at that point, you're going to see, okay, there's a, a major change in that. Now, I know there's going to be people that are like conspiracy theorists that are going to say, oh, these are all paid actors by Naudi, but it's like, maybe that could be it. Maybe I could be uh, funneling money into somebody's business or bank account. But all I know is that I don't have deep pockets. I don't really know where I'm getting this money from. And I've had to build everything from scratch with what I'm doing. So at some point, uh, that's another thing where, you know, you're not going to sat fully satisfy everyone. I, I, I fully understand that. But at the end of the day, if you keep taking that, if I keep taking this path of saying, how do I serve people? And I teach everybody at Functional Patterns how to serve people. Um, that's at some level our differential advantage. And that tells you that differential advantage can be a good thing if your real idea is to serve people. The problem is how you serve people sometimes can be limited. Let's say if I'm in FP and I teach you a bunch of great techniques or whatever, and somebody else comes along or some other technology comes along and, uh, completely eliminates, makes me obsolescent and makes the, the techniques that I did obsolescent, obsolete, might I be closed off to the potentials of that thing, um, you know, taking away my advantage. There's a potential for that. And I'd hope that I would respond better if that situation came. I would not respond better. I hope that because it hasn't happened yet, but I'd hope that I would respond well. That's what my hope is. And my life is kind of prepared around that. I think at some point as artificial intelligence comes in, it's going to make 
a lot of industries irrelevant and our differential advantages are going to be exposed. So my concern is trying to be as useful as possible, is trying to become as competent as possible and trying to be as emotionally stable as possible. So when that day comes and I'm made irrelevant, that I'm not going to feel so uh, bad about myself. Um, in general, I don't think people think about differential advantage as much as they do because it's a, it's a harsh life. Like, let me, let me put it this way. If I happen to be five or six inches taller than what I am now, and my nose happened to be less crooked and my cranium wasn't rotated I'm clearly to my right here, and uh, my nose wasn't ex much disproportionately uh, long and my nostrils were wider and my mandible wasn't so childlike, um, and I was, again, six inches taller, and I carried some of the same physical attributes, my position would tell me that, you know, I don't really need to innovate. I it wouldn't matter. At that point, I would probably write on my looks. And I would be like, you know what, I'm going to try and focus on being a model or maybe some kind of an athlete of some type. My position of advantage, or my differential advantage would not be based upon trying to help people. So I understand that my position of advantage is circumstantial. And in the same regard, if I'm less attractive like I am now, I'm not like the best looking guy on the planet. Uh, I'm so, I hover somewhere probably between like maybe a five or a seven in terms of attractiveness, depending on what society might say, I might be even uglier or even more attractive depending on what a person's into. Um, because I hover around there, I, I'm given, I, I'm, I'm just unattractive enough to not be completely demoralized uh, like uh, uh, by life, like, or to give me initiative to want to do something. But then I'm, I'm attractive enough to not be completely demoralized by my situation. And I can, this is harsh. I know this is probably really, really like, it may, may give people some anxiety with what I'm saying, but at some point you have to be willing to understand what your circumstance is. If I looked how I did and I was born into a very, very wealthy family, which I wasn't, um, my differential advantage would be much different. Um, it, this, this happens uh, all the time. This, this happens all the time in our world. And uh, people aren't really willing to own up to that. People don't say, well, what have I been given? What are the what are the skills that I've been given? Sometimes you may not have to have you may not have skills. Sometimes you may not have great talents. The question comes back to is how do you develop skills and how do you develop indispensable talents and how do you become useful to other people? That's really what it is in any circumstance. But it's difficult because if you're already the person, if let's say. For example, I would love a type one civilization. I, I think it would be the best civilization that we could have. And I think if we reach a type one civilization, everybody would have the facial structure of like a Brad Pitt or some other attractive person because we would code that out. We would find, we would map out the code and then reconfigure people's looks. And you could actually physically, based upon the fact that we're eukaryotes, actually change the way that you look. I could untwist my cranium and not look like it. I mean, every day I look at myself too, guys, and I'm like, oh my God, my face is so disfigured. It's fucking crazy. It's insane how disfigured my face is. And it's, it's amazing how disfigured my body is in relation to my cranium. And I'm like, wow, I got some work to do. But nonetheless, the way I see it, I think a type one civilization would be good for all people, not just unattractive. And I think there is such a thing as unattractive and attractive people. I know Jock Fresco has talked about that. He feels that if you could be attractive to have a bone in your nose, but that's an aberration. If you want to talk about having really good health, it's good to have a good well-formed set of glutes. A good, to, It's good to, and healthy to have a well-formed uh, set of obliques and pec muscles. Like you need to have those things in order to be healthy, I think at some level. So I think people who have those things, and I think it's good, I know it's good to have a good airway, like to have a, a little slightly broader nose and good well-formed nostrils and whatnot. It's healthy to have all these things. And so there is a, a quantifiable way to measure attractiveness based upon functionality. There's a functional body. And I think the functional body is a healthy body. So based upon where you are along that scale, um, a lot of times that's going to influence your strategies in life. Your differential advantages are going to be different based upon the presets that you were given. Uh, Donald Trump, I think Donald Trump was actually a pretty good looking kid, guy when he was younger. But that said, he's definitely not good looking now. That guy's he's not aged particularly well, but his differential advantage was the fact that he had money. But if this system has already worked for you, you might think you're living in a type one civilization already. It may already work for you. 
And sometimes I think in general, this is why you don't tend to find a lot of the really attractive people, like super ultra attractive people really buy into FP because FP at, at its fundamental level is built upon the idea of understanding what you're up against, understanding that, you know what, you know, maybe if I, maybe if I'm just, maybe I don't have to work as hard because I'm, I'm, I, I have a particular body or a particular set of looks that will help me overcome not having to be as competent. Maybe like I'll be able to develop a profile within myself to, to uh, because of my presets that won't make me have to work as hard. And in general, we always think that way. And I, you know, on my end, I, I feel that a lot of what drove me to be where I'm at is the fact that I'm a short man. A lot of that has to have, has to be a part, a part of it. If I was a taller person, you probably, I wouldn't be who I am today, which is why I don't really extract a lot of meaning out of, out of life because I realize that my supposed meaning is built upon things that were beyond my control. And if there is meaning, it's outside of my control. I'm pretty much just, I, I, I'm, I'm an organism that's smart enough to understand what I'm up against. And I strategize in relation to the presets that I have in relation to the people that I have around me. So I've worked around that and I've been real about that for quite some time. And I think when I understand this term differential advantage, it helps me recognize much more, uh, where I stand within the social hierarchy and what I can do not to dominate the hierarchy. And in many ways I do because I have many people that follow me, but in the, in the, in beyond that, it's, it's how do I make a contribution? What do I do to kind of eliminate this fucking hierarchy? It's not healthy to have hierarchies. I know Jordan Peterson says, you know, we need to have hierarchies in order to, to uh, exist in our society in order for society to exist. And although that's true at the moment, should it always be that way? What happens when a robot is higher than all humans in terms of its functional capabilities? Then where, where does where do dominance hierarchies fit within humans? They really don't. That's that's the question. So I don't think that at some point, I think at some point, uh, hierarchical structures are going to have to be eliminated. And I firmly believe that. And it's not health. The, the, the fundamental question is that, yeah, maybe hierarchies do need to exist at the current state. But is it healthy to have hierarchies in our society? And the obvious answer is no. Everybody, at least from what I've seen in my life, I don't look at scientific studies a lot of times because I think you can, there's too many confounding variables that to, to really quantify whether a scientific study uh, is really relevant. There's too many variables. There's ways that you can do good science. There are ways, but I think it just costs a lot of money to do that. But I don't really read the studies in that regard, especially with regard to, um, to humans and their, um, uh, what the hell was I just talking about? What was I just talking? I just lost my train of thought. Uh, not needing hierarchies. Yeah, not needing hierarchies. I, I don't think you. Should, I don't think we need hierarchies. Like I, I, I think at some point we have to move beyond this hierarchical nonsense uh, because it's not healthy. It's not healthy for me. Like I, I don't get to sleep as well as I probably should because I have to constantly keep my company afloat and keep everything rolling so I can like preserve this company. So I'm not fucking completely stressed out all the time. And, uh, and then because I'm, so I'm not stressed out all the time. I'm, like I have to, I have to maintain balance. So I'm not sick because if I'm sick, then I can't do anything. And I've been pretty damn sick in the past, uh, doing not obviously doing functional patterns, but all the things that come outside of it. And there are some aspects of functional patterns that are dysfunctional that I'm still cleaning up. This, this isn't a complete system by any stretch of the imagination. But the point being is that, my strategies are built around creating a type one civilization. I think I've come up to that realization. And I think a lot of what's helped me come to that realization guys is that I've, that I've kind of, I haven't had sex with a lot of women and much of that is because of choice because I was afraid for my health. And so I was like, I don't know if I want to put my penis inside that woman, because if I do, that could be damaging. Um, I could have uh, diseases that come along with that, or I could even have a bunch of stress that comes along with it too. So I just don't know if I want to be involved with this particular person. So I stay away. I don't put my penis inside that person. So I've oftentimes made that decision, but what I think oftentimes males don't do is it, they, they are selective about what, who they have sex with and they kind of just take on whoever they can. And let's say at some point, there's a lot of males in general in our society who haven't had the most mating opportunities. And they've never overcome the fears of rejection to be able to give themselves more ma mating opportunities. They haven't strategized. Like, let's say for example, if I was less attractive than what I am right now, like I'm fortunate that I still have somewhat of a mesomorphic um, endomorphic physique that enables me to kind of like 
for a woman to be like, okay, you know, he's easier to have sex with. Um, but if I didn't have that, then I would have to strategize my life in a new particular fashion to be able to attract that particular thing of having sex. So um, I've had problems attracting women, but it hasn't been like a, a really, really, really bad problem. I'm a short guy, but I have certain attributes within myself that still make me somewhat attractive to women. Um, but with that said, I've, I've managed to keep it real within myself to, to know how to create that abundance for myself. Um, but then once I kind of got it based upon attaining a little bit of status, I realized, you know what? A monogamous relationship makes a whole lot more sense. There's a lot less stress involved and my, and my health is going to suffer if I decide to not follow a monogamous relationship, which is why I chose a monogamous relationship. It just seems like it's a healthier path to go down. Am I going to get married? Absolutely not. There's no way I'm going to partake in marriage and I'm definitely not going to have children. Not I don't have any aspirations of having children. I never have. I've never like kids are cool. I've, I've met kids that are fascinating. Like they're don't get me wrong. I don't have problems with children. I'm just not, I don't want to take on that responsibility myself. Maybe I'm afraid of it and I'm open to that idea of it, but I just, I don't have an inkling to really want to do that at this given moment. Maybe if society was more functional, I would then say, you know, I would have a daughter or a son or something like that would be cool. Maybe if society was more functional, I'd be like, you know what, this is a cool place to bring somebody into. I'm going to bring them in, but relative to the current state of society and, and how people aren't willing to accept that differential advantage is influencing them on a regular basis. Um, I can't do it and I'm not going to do it. There's just no ways that I'm going to be able to do this. Um, but never mind that. I, like, I, I, there's multiple reasons why I'm choosing not to have children. And, um, our society doesn't seem like it's getting, it seems like there's some progressive aspects of society, but I have a feeling that I would burden my child with my uh, problems, with my psychological problems, with all the expectations that I would put upon them and all the seriousness that I would imp imp input on them. And I think that child, uh, th they could end up suicidal. I don't even know if I would even be a, a, a fully stable parent. I think I would understand enough to make him a functional person. But um, in many ways, I think I would probably be a detriment to the child as well, just based upon how I am. So I'm not going to take that risk. So I don't want to have kids. But that said, I still am for monogamy for myself, just because it causes less problems. But at some point I had to create a, some, some level of competence with myself. I had to succeed to some degree within my life to understand that I don't really need to have, you know, a harem. I don't need to have multiple women to have sex with. Do I still have urges of wanting to be, you know, uh, polyamorous? Absolutely. Of course, it's hard to, to wipe that away. Uh, males, in order to procreate, to duplicate themselves, to attain some sense of, uh, of permanent survival, uh, they have to have orgasms in order to do that. They have to ejaculate. Women don't. They don't necessarily have to ejaculate to have babies. They just need to ovulate. And ovulation isn't necessarily directly correlated to, to, uh, to having an orgasm. But men do need to have orgasms. So I think at, at a biological level, it's more difficult for a man to switch that thing off. But I think that's even more driven by the fact that we have uh, social pressures. But even if you look at chimpanzees, the reason they choose to dominate within a hierarchy, at least from what uh, some researchers say, uh, is because uh, they are seeking to uh, have to be polyamorous and have as many mating opportunities as possible. Um, so maybe that could be also their differential advantage. That's how they strategize towards passing on their genes and whatnot. So I don't know. It, I, guess, I guess it gets pretty complicated. Maybe I should just kind of move on from where I was talking about um, from what I was talking about. So the next uh, question that I asked myself or the next topic that I'm going to put Fourth uh, goes back to uh, how does uh, the necessity for towards making profit influence differential advantage? Um, it influences it greatly. Um, in our society, we, we have to make money to live. And at, at some point, if we can't, if, if let me give you an example, like a, a struggle that I've had. Um, I've had uh, to push posture and three-dimensional movement and running and throwing and gait cycles for a very long time. For a very long time, my industry was obsessed with like squat analysis. When I came into the industry, the overhead squat assessment was the, the benchmark of, um, of functionality or determinants. Uh, if, if you guys don't know that, it's just like you're squatting down and you're bringing your hands above your head and you're measuring like asymmetries when, when somebody does that. Can an overhead squat assessment be good? Yeah, to some degree, but if, if you think about the 
the force transmission involved in a, in a overhead squat assessment, there really is none. It, it doesn't really du duplicate what we go through in a sling based movement. So like a sling based movement is something like running or throwing where there's quick bursts, where there's explosive mo motions. Uh, we, we navigate this reality as, uh, as slings, as slingers more so than we do as uh, static movers. The gait cycle is very slingy. It's very whippy. If you understand like uh, the kinetics well enough, you're going to understand that uh, the gate cycle isn't uh, that the overhead squat assessment is not going to account for gate dynamics. It's not going to account for in general, three dimensional movement for human beings, or even just in general, uh, most of the motions found with, with vertebrates and uh, who move fast. You may have a sloth or something like that. Uh, you know, where, where a sloth moves slowly. Um, but in general, you're going to find that, you know, if you look at a gazelle, a lion, a cheetah, a leopard, a deer, a bird, in general, you're going to find that vertebrates whip into their motions. And the overhead squat assessment isn't really accounting for those factors. It's not accounting for those variables. And I knew this at some point. I was like, the gait cycle seems like it's much more uh, important when it comes to understanding, to, to mapping out dysfunctions, on, or to mapping out functionality and dysfunctionality on a human body. So I was like, okay. So I, I, I started pushing this. I started pushing all that and I kept saying, you know, the gate cycle is what we have to do. And I had to repeat this message over and over and over again. And in 2018, it's a much more popular thing. The, the idea of human biomechanics uh, being uh, fundamental in training these days is much more common. You're seeing the perform better summits. You're seeing the, the idea health expos. You're seeing many people who've even taken basic functional patterns courses who are teaching those concepts to everybody at this point. And in general, everybody understands that gate is kind of the driving mechanism to all things. But for the longest time, I had to deal with people saying, well, we do the same thing. Functional patterns is claiming to do that. We also improve gait. Deadlifts improve gait. They improve and make you run faster. Hip thrusters make you run faster. Back squats make you run faster. They make you run uh, more efficiently too. They help improve your gait because they stimulate your posterior chain. The problem, And from there, I'm like, that's not true. You can't do that. It's impossible. Anytime that you walk, you're involving this thing called contralateral reciprocation, right? You guys see how I'm doing that? What that means, you're going to have two limbs moving in, in oppositional directions of one another. And if you have limbs moving in oppositional directions of one another, uh, something like a deadlift doesn't make sense. When you, when you are at the bottom of a deadlift, you have to realize your knees are going to slightly bend uh, proportionally to one another in the same direction at the bottom phase. They're going to extend in the same direction uh, as at the same time. Your hips are going to shift and uh, they're going to shift anteriorly and posteriorly relative to the bottom in the, in the same direction, both sides of the pelvis, they're gonna move the same way. And so if you look at something like a deadlift, it doesn't translate to gait mechanics at all because a deadlift is a sagittal plane motion. The gait cycle is a multi-dimensional motion the entire time. The rotation front, the, the transverse frontal, sagittal, and even longitudinal are all involved in uh, the gait cycle. All of them. It's four dimensions of movement involved in uh, four directions of movement involved in the gait cycle. De deadlifts, back squats, and hip thrusters don't account for any of these variables. They account for one variable at a time, but if you want to be more precise about how you're going to change movement in reality, you have to account for all the variables simultaneously. All of them. So with that said, uh, I had to deal with a huge struggle in terms of promoting my company, show, displaying my differential advantage with, uh, with other people. And in that regard, people's profit was impeding others from being able to get more relevant information at the time. Uh, was it a good thing that they were doing that? I don't know. Did it make me have to work that much more in order to, to figure this stuff out? Did it drive me a little bit further to have to figure this stuff out? Maybe. But honestly, man, I love this shit. I love training people. And I know if I stepped away and I had all the money in the world, um, I would want to keep training people because it's fun. It is not that it's fun. It just feels good to know that you're able to alleviate somebody's suffering. Because in myself, I've suffered a lot. I think we all suffer to some degree, no matter whether you're on the you're the top 1% or the bottom at the 99% or even somewhere in the middle. I think everybody has to deal with trauma, man. Somebody in your life has been fucking hurt. Somebody has been something problematic has happened with them. Something's happened to your mom, your dad. In some way, shape, or form, we're all traumatized. Wars have happened. We're all the by, we're all traumatized to some degree. 
to know that in some way you can alleviate that suffering is fucking awesome. And more importantly, to know that you can alleviate that suffering without ha giving them so many next negative externalities that will hurt them more later on down the road feels really good. And that's what my concern is. And I'm still, I, every time that I train somebody, man, I don't train them and tell them like, look, I'm going to solve all your problems. I say, Hey, look, these are roadways that we need to travel down. These are things that you need to address if you want to attain more functionality. If you want to be able to function better as a human with your thoughts, with your physicality, whatever it may be, these are paths that you need to go on if you want to solve your problems. But I'll tell you right now, I don't have all those answers. I have some answers. I have a good, a good amount of them. Uh, how far they go? I don't know. They seem to be working for me. I work like a fucking madman and I'm holding together fairly well. But with that said, how far does it go? That's the question. And, um, it, I don't think it goes far enough. I don't think that what I do goes far enough, which is why I keep doing more and more of it. But in general, I, it does feel good to train people. It does feel good to train them. I still train people uh, on a routine basis because it makes me feel good. Um, do I get paid for it? Obviously, that's a part of how business works. The only way you keep yourself afloat is by maintaining a business. And, and, uh, and in order for you to do that, you have to make a profit. So... With that said, um, I'm still going to have to aim to make a profit. And when a company gets bigger, more people want to plagiarize, more people – this is the complication that most people don't consider is that when a company gets bigger, more people want to use your brand, more people want to manipulate things to use your brand to proliferate themselves and their business because that's their – that's what they're trying to do is find a differential advantage without having to necessarily work. And so then at that point, you're spending a great deal of your money on research and development and uh, and lawyer fees to try and protect your brand's image and to, to develop the right agreements and whatnot so everybody understands what the what the boundaries are this is what it's like to run a business i don't think most people see that they kind of just see the numbers they just they look at jeff bezos and they say you know jeff bezos makes i forgot like a hundred and some thousand dollars every 10 seconds something like that some ridiculous number but they also don't see how much money he has to invest to keep the company alive, how many lawsuits the guy probably has to deal with on a regular basis, some somebody getting hurt or somebody just not liking him or whatever, all the problems that he has to juggle. Uh, people don't realize, like you guys all think, oh, it's great to be Jeff Bezos, but there's a lot more people that hate that guy than people that love that guy. And that guy can't go anywhere. If he goes out into the public, it's really difficult for him to go anywhere in, in, in reality. Uh, because a lot of people just in general don't like business people. They look at corporate executives or the owners of corporations and they say, this is a bad person because they're trying to make money. They don't take these things into consideration. And sim simply put, the differential advantage that everybody uh, runs under is that they want to have an easier life uh, in general. And most of us don't want to work fundamentally to have an, e an easier life because working makes life hard. <laughs> so that's that's the complication in all of it. So uh, – does a necessity towards making profit uh, hurt people, or is it? Is it? Does that make? Uh, does the necessity for making profit influence a person's differential advantage? Absolutely, everybody does, and we all have strategies. Like I said, we all have strategies. Fresco, no, go to your bed. Come here, Baba. Go to your bed. No, no barking. Sorry, guys. Um. No, no. Um, here's my next thing. Uh, when does differential advantage work? Well, we have to classify whether it's working for you on an individual basis in terms of what you want. Uh, when you get an advantage in life, what are you trying to get an advantage for? That's the question. And then we have to talk about, well, what does it mean for society, which is the more important thing that when does differential advantage work for everyone? Because that's really what matters. I think that differential advantage works on a personal level when you optimize your health and you put that as your focus, sole focus in life, because if you focus on your health, then I think you're going to influence other people that want to be healthy and they're going to make this healthy decisions. And that's what has a great impact on everybody else being healthy. Now, how do we quantify health? That's a tough, that's a tough thing to, uh, to analyze. I think, I think intrinsically we understand what it means. We can look at somebody and say that person's ill or not. I think, you look at people and you can tell that person seems cleanly. They seem like their skin's healthy or whatever. I think we can look at people. If you look at jittery motions or twitchy motions or overly compensated motions in people's body language, I think at some terms we can determine whether somebody's healthy at a physical or mental level. 
I think this is all, this can all be determined, but um, when does it work for everybody? It works for everybody. I think when we all start thinking about, well, is this healthy? Like, for example, who was I talking? I forgot who I was talking to about this. Um, where I was talking about like the fundamental premise of their relationship. Like this is a friend of mine who, who I was talking to and, you know, and they were somewhat confused. I said, well, what the, what the hell? Like, I want, I want to try and eliminate the drama from my, from my, from my uh, relationship. And I don't, I don't know what the hell to do. And I'm like, this person keeps eliciting this behavior and I don't like that behavior and it, and it bothers me and I want to change it. And, and I've quantified that their behavior is my behavior is the better of the, of the behaviors. And, uh, so then he was like, well, what do I do? I'm like, well, what's the premise of your, of your, of your relationship? And he was like, uh, couldn't give me a clear answer. The premise of my relationship is built upon health. Do we complement each other to make each other healthy? That's the whole premise of it. And what determines health? That's a complicated thing. I think, uh, I think overcoming addictions, and really when you think about overcoming addictions in the terms that Jock Fresco brings it up, when he says addiction is just uh, the utilization of one system uh, to, um, how do I put it? It's the dependence on one system to get by on life. And you can make that argument for FP saying, well, FP is one system. And, uh, and so you have to diversify that, you know, functional patterns. If you're addicted to functional patterns, that it can impede other parts of your life. I'm sure that's a potential. But as you guys know, FP is an all-inclusive system for anything that is scientific that may help. I've had people that recommended, but for example, Wim Hof, I didn't discover him on my own. I discovered Wim Hof from somebody who was an FP. So they said, hey, try this breathing. And I was like, I already kind of focus on breathing. I kind of already do breathing and I feel like I have a decent control over it, but fuck it. Let me give this thing a shot and see what happens. I tried his variant variation of breathing. I, and this guy told me, hey, I've done the yogi breathing. He had already done all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, let me give this a shot. I tried it. I started doing the breathing and I was like, oh shit. I haven't done this before. I felt certain things like this when I would breathe deeply the way that Wim Hof does it, but I was afraid of that. I had felt that, but I was like, don't go that, don't start getting lightheaded because you might pass out. So take, take a step away from that. So I told myself that Wim Hof just pushed that beyond that boundary. And I'm like, okay, I still use it. I need to practice it more. I need to get back on it. And I'm going to, in fact, just by me even talking about it right now, I need to get on it today. I'm going to get, make sure that I get back on it and, and start working on it. But um, that's the inclusion of another system. Uh, myofascial release is a system. Uh, you know, uh, corrective exercise is a system, right? The kettlebell as a tool, the movements involved within a tool is a system. These are all systems. Uh, quantifying, like using quantifiable language, right? Using language that's not subject to interpretation is a system. These are all systems that I employ within the functional pattern system. So maybe that is a system and maybe that system is addictive to some degree, that said, if you feel healthier doing it and it's helping you and you're realizing that there's not as many negative externalities with that help as using something else, then ultimately uh, we, we can determine that that's probably a healthier thing. When you have less dependencies on certain things, when you can find more self-control within yourself, one might determine that that's health. And if you base your relationship upon that, you're probably going to have a healthier relationship with who you're with. You're going to have more real dialogue. You're going to be more honest with one another. And that's going to make a big impact on a, on a, you know, freaking, that's going to make a, a, a big impact. If your relationship is built upon health, it's going to make a big impact uh, on the, on the types of dialogue that you have. And in general, the productivity that you're going to have altogether uh, within your relationship. So when does differential advantage work? When the differential advantage is becoming healthy, you're like, is that healthy? I don't think I want to do that. And I think we're moving towards that direction as a species. A great deal of us are moving in that direction, knowing where climate change is going and you know that this experiment, as uh, Elon Musk would say, that this experiment to dump CO2 into the environment, uh, you know, could have dire consequences uh, and it could impact all of our health. So I think in general, society is moving in that direction. And I think that's one of the promising aspects of what's going on in our world. Um, hopefully that uh, that spreads. Um, when is differential, uh, differential advantage a bad thing? Uh, differential advantage is a bad thing when uh, we're, we're pursuing things that are counter to health that aren't healthy. That's when I think differential advantage is a bad thing when you're not choosing to be healthy. I've done some of the psychedelics. I, I can't say I've gone deep into it. I, if, if I smoke marijuana, um, which I do from time to time, I consume it from time to time. When I do that, um, 
I get some pretty strong uh, psychedelic trips even with that. Um, and it's, it's, I'm not addicted to it though. Like I know when to step, you know, maybe I am addicted, who the hell knows, but I try and use it as a tool. That's the objective. I don't use it as the only crutch that I have. I use it as a tool. And if you use it as a tool, it's not really a drug anymore. It's just a tool. But um, I forgot I forgot what prompted that. But anyway, um, differential advantage can be damaging when we, when we try and strategize things to pursue things that aren't there. For example, if I'm a man and I want to continually sleep with all sorts of different women for the sake of feeling like a big shot, I would classify that as a uh, – you know, th that life strategy or that goal and you using, making strategies to, um, to make it in this world, to attain that as a, as a bad thing. That's when differential advantage can be a bad thing. When the differential advantage is everybody being taken care of, um, that's when, when it counts. That said, guys, I'm not like, I'm not preaching a Christian doctrine where I can say I can help everybody. You can't help everybody. Um, I've tried, but Sometimes if, if, if I can try and get people to say, you know what, like I, if I, for example, and I, and I put this on the on my uh, on one of the social media outlets that I have on my biomechanics culture page on on uh, on Facebook, I put up a poll saying, why don't people want to read uh, or why, why don't people want to study Jock Fresco? And I gave I let it out, list out a set of reasons, potential reasons for why people do that. And sometimes if you bring up the, the thing this premise of differential advantage people get offended because at some point they realize you know what i didn't have all the advantages in life and i feel like i'm a loser because of it and you're kind of revealing that i'm a loser because of because i'm not attractive not even or jock fresco what you're saying by what you do is that i'm not very attractive that i have a lot of things to work on man i realize i'm not very attractive I understand that there's a lot about this, like my crooked ears. I think this is this ear. You guys will notice this ear flops out even more. You guys want to know why this ear flops out even more? Kind of why my face kind of tends to kind of squish more this way. Uh, one time I was at an arcade and uh, my mom was at the mall. She was trying to find me. She had to be somewhere, I think. She was really pissed off. So she literally pulled my ear to the point where she I could feel my skull pop. And now my this ear, I think it's this ear. This one's the one that pops out more, right? Yeah. So from what I remember, I think it was this ear. She wanted to go like that. It went pop. And then the ear went up staying in that place. So um, I don't know one time I was running for my brother and it was in the snow <laughs> and uh, we were running and like our porch had ice on it and I ran and I was trying to run from him. And then I ran and then like the, the edge of like the screen door went up popping me right here. So if you guys, that was like the original deviated septum. I wound up looking like a fucking rhinoceros uh, after that that influenced my, my deviated septum. So I'm a concoction of problems, guys. Uh, if my brother wasn't so stressed out and my family wasn't so stressed out and we were all fucking so stressed out, we probably wouldn't, I probably wouldn't have had all these issues, but I have all these issues. I realize what I'm up against. I've come, but I'm trying to fix it to the best that I can. Am I going to fail in the process of it? Likely there's a high likelihood that I'm going to fail, but dude, I'm going to go out swinging while I'm doing it. I'm, I'm not a bitch in life by any stretch. So I'm going to, I'm going to swing for the fences. That's how I do every punch. I'm going to make sure I can keep my punches controlled as much as possible, but I'm going to swing for the fences, man. I'm going to go as, as, uh, as hard in the paint with me fixing my problems as I possibly can, because I understand that it doesn't demoralize me, man. And I think it's because I was raised a certain way that, um, taught me to think that way. Oh, I got a problem. Do something about it fucking don't sit there and mope get off your ass and do something about it and i don't i don't think everybody was raised with that same set of values and if i can hopefully by you guys watching me right now inspire that within you to say hey look man if you could if you have math at your disposal if you have con the Khan academy at your disposal and you can learn how math is or learn math or all these types of things and you're sick of looking at yourself being the way that you are and you feel that you know what I am at the bottom level of, uh, of, of the social hierarchy and I, I feel like I can't move up. I'm just saying, look, you got all these options. If, if you abide by Freskian principles, if you study Jock Fresco, it gives you, it gives you confidence in knowing that you can overcome your circumstance in any situation. That's how I felt about myself where it was like, look, dude, you're going to have to work, but there's going to be a fucking reward to that at the end of when it's all said and done. That to me, and it doesn't necessarily mean money because I didn't come into this thinking, okay, I'm going to make a bunch of money. Um, I was broke for the majority of my career. I wasn't making any goddamn money. Like 
I wasn't making any money most of my career. So it's like now I'm turning a profit finally. Uh, but even then I still, what does that even really mean? What am I going to buy with it? A van and live inside a van? Oof, I'm going to be balling out. But never mind all that. Um, that the idea that I get from Jock Fresco is that your possibilities are literally limitless, but you have to objectively look at what the hell is going on with you and objective to the point of what am I doing on a, on a minute by minute basis that's bringing me into failure. Uh, and by failure, it's, it, it's not bringing money into the equation. It's just saying what's keeping me from becoming a healthier person and spreading health to other people. What's holding me back from doing that? For example, if I'm carved out of granite and I got muscles everywhere and I look healthy and I tell people, hey, look, man, I'm 50 years old and I look like I'm in my 20s, people are going to say, well, what's the secret? They're going to listen to me at some point. You're going to become successful in that regard. If you just become a beacon of health, you don't have to have a lot of money. People are just going to be like, fuck, you don't have a lot of money. But dude, you look amazing. What the fuck are you doing? Eventually, people are going to say that. And I know for many people, they're thinking, well, I don't want to wait 20, 30 years to get that notoriety. Dude, sometimes you have to. If you're a, and I remember one time I had, a, I had a discussion with my brother, and he had talked to somebody else about this. And he's like, look, bro, now do you like – you get too strung up on trying to like, you know, figure shit out right now or, and get your notoriety and whatnot. At some point you got to realize, bro, you're not going to get your notoriety until you're probably in your sixties. You're not going to hit your prime right now. My, I don't even know if I'm going to make it to 60 years old. I may die of a fucking heart attack of stress. Uh, who the fuck knows? I may not make, I don't plan to make it to 60. I plan to make it to tomorrow. That's, that's my only objective. How do I make it to tomorrow? And how do I plan to make it to, I, my hope, my goal is to make it to 200. That's my objective. But I always my my premise in life is that I always hope for the best and plan for the worst. That's how it is. So the worst is I don't make it to tomorrow. The best is I'm going to at least live to 200 to 300 years old. That's what I'm aiming to do. A lot of people are going to be like, dude, you're fucking crazy by doing that. But I think I have – if you understand the science deep enough, I think you'll be able to figure a lot of that stuff out. Um, I think you'll be able to figure out why I feel the way that I do about that. But anyway um, – Differential advantage is bad when uh, people aim to do the wrong things. And I think the wrong things are to pursue things that are counter to health. And if you want to be healthy, uh, I, I've spent like lots and lots and lots of money on, on supplements, on devices, technology, all this stuff. That's part of the reason why – that's what I spent my money on to see if I could find a device that works for me. And you want to know what the device that works the best for me is uh, for attaining really good health? It's probably just getting out into nature and eating fish. Those are the ones that seem to work the best for me. And obviously, the biomechanics is a huge part of it because that's kind of like the – that's what enables me to retain more battery fluid, hence water, because I don't have myofascial restrictions. But if I really was to tell you what gives me the best – health feeling, it's getting out into nature. Does it solve all the problems? Almost. It solves a lot of the problems. Just getting out into nature and just chilling out in nature for a while and doing with it sober a lot of times. Or sometimes I'll take a brownie with me or something. Who knows? Um, but most of the time I don't – actually, I don't think I've ever been high, fully high in nature. only time I do it is when I'm stressed out. And every time that I get high, it's like, dude, you got to get out into nature. It's all the plant communicates to me. So with that said um, – I think at some point if we realize that, you know, that we have a very important connection with, uh, with nature. We're going to understand that, um, you know, fucking that we shouldn't, that our differential advantage should all be strategized towards becoming healthy. So then we can make a healthier population and, and hence have a, have better health. Um, and this leads to my final point here where I'm going to talk about it, that I think that differential advantage is part of the ev evolutionary uh, process. I think we all have particular skills. We all have ways that we can adapt and we all have strategies that we're going to employ because not everybody is equal in our world. Not all animals are equal. Not all people are equal. And so what we try and do oftentimes is just adapt into a scenario. And we sometimes we, we skew a message to try and put ourselves into a position of value, even if we, there is no value there. Um, for example, if you're in banking or something like that, and you say, well, you know what? Fucking money is everything. Well, Money is everything if everybody believes that money is everything. What is money everything if nobody believes in that shit? Obviously not. I say uh, everybody needs to be healthy. Well, health doesn't mean anything if nobody, to nobody if people don't value that shit. So is there a consequence for not, for, for not partaking in the monetary system? 
Absolutely. Is there a consequence for not partaking in uh, healthy behaviors? Absolutely. Um, so with that said, uh, I think differential advantage is an extension of biology. And I think capitalism itself, which is the, the dominant system of our society, there's still obviously lots of socialism within it, but capitalism in and of itself is, uh, is an extension of biological mechanisms, right? Uh, it, it's, it's survival of the fittest. That's kind of how it is. And it's fucked up and I don't fully agree with it. And I think we can move past it. Um, I just don't think we're going to move past it with the, with the way that we're thinking right now, oftentimes. Um, anyway, I saw, I see a few question, questions here. Um, let me see. Not too many questions, which is cool. Uh, somebody put money, technology, Elon. Oh yeah. Um, oh, I think Juan was in there trying to help. Thanks, Juanma. Um, what if someone conned their way through life to earn lots of money, but once they had the money, started to feel guilty and then use the money to contribute to functional causes? If it was actually a functional cause, then that would be cool. But the problem is a lot of times they don't – let me put it this way. Um, like Bill Gates uh, and, um, and Jeff Bezos, and, and people hate these fucking guys not realizing they're really important people and that we need to have them in society doing what they're doing. They're uh, investing lots and lots of money into, I believe, fusion or fission reactors. I think fusion reactors that have very uh, small amounts of negative externalities, very small, uh, you know, remainders on their, uh, on the energy variable. They're investing a lot of money into that. And so that said, I don't know if they really did anything wrong, man. I think it's not really to say that anybody really does anything wrong. Even if somebody does earn a lot of money, the problem that I have is that in the process of earning all that money, do they really understand the deep mechanisms of what they did wrong to begin with? So if they say, look, uh, I'm going to take that money and I'm going to get donated to some charity and that charity feeds people, but doesn't teach them the mechanisms of which people get fed in, in our culture, that's not helping right? You're, you're making those people weaker. You gotta, you, you can't just give them food. You gotta give them certain types of education. You gotta teach them to become practical. You have to teach them to become scientific in the way that they do things and teach them to be sustainable, teach them how to be healthy. Once it, once you've given them the food or you give them the opportunities to feed themselves, you tell them, well, this is how you are healthy. Nobody really concerns themselves with that. Like Bill Gates right now, he, one thing that I don't agree with is, you know, he's trying to feed people. He's sitting in front of this big pile of fertilizer, but I don't know if Bill Gates is because the fertilizer is going to feed a lot of people. I'm thinking, well, Bill, I don't know if that fertilizer is really going to be that great because I don't know where that fertilizer came from. How far are you looking to actually determine whether that fertilizer is going to put more fucking contaminants into our soil that's going to then hurt people? And how much of that fertilizer is actually going to, um, to, to help? You might feed somebody in the short term, but then you're going to degenerate a bunch of people and then they're going to die of cancer later on anyway, man, after they have a few kids. So the problem that I have with somebody saying, well, what if I end up making a lot of money and then I use that money to solve problems? Well, are you really going to solve problems? Is your Are your thoughts really oriented to that? Are you going to invest in the right people? Because if you were, then you see all the billionaires giving Elon their money. And Elon gets a lot of money. Don't get me wrong. A lot of people invest in him. He's subsidized by the government. But billionaires should be giving Elon way more money to solve way more problems. I've been talking about a lot of relevant problems myself. And in general, I don't see a lot of billionaires <laughs> coming in and knocking down my door to say, hey, man, what do you suggest to solve these damn problems? Instead, they give to these charities that on the surface make people feel good about what they're doing, but they don't really do anything. They don't really solve the fucking problem. So if, if they use that money for things that improve the functionality of society – and actually got the people who were in their predicament out of their situation and made them independent of, of their of their of their circumstance, which is dysfunctional. Then I would say, yeah, that's cool. If they're promoting good health with that, I would say, yeah. But a lot of times, these mega billionaires just seem to like they want to just clear their conscience and say, you know what, I feel like shit about how I pursued my life. Uh, let me do these motivational speeches or uh, or freaking donate to these charities or start my own charity. That doesn't really do much. Um, you don't pull people out of poverty by giving them shit. I mean, you, you you do, but the shit that you give them is opportunities to like make something of themselves, to build confidence. You got to build their confidence by giving them relevant education. If you teach them how to read and write and things like that, cool. But then teach them the implications of what it means to be able to read and write. Teach them the implications of mathematics. 
if you turn if, if you make it fun and you make it interesting with these charities then i'm all with it i'm all for it and if you guys know of charities that are doing that and that these mega rich people are doing that then that's great but but it has to go far enough it, you, you can't just say, look, I'm going to give a bunch of poor people a bunch of resources and food and whatnot and then not solve the damn problem. You have to go further than that. You got to say, well, what's actually going to solve the problem? Because isn't that the problem? The fact that we have a problem, isn't that the issue? That's the concern that I have. So it's a really good question, Ramon Garcia. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I really I appreciate that question, brother. So I think if somebody does do the, go down that path, I just feel that by the time that they get to the point that they've made all the money, that their brain is going to be so warped to some degree, if they only were in it because of the money, that they're not going to understand how to solve a problem later on when the when they are going to try and solve the problem. They're going to be so diluted in their brain from reality. They're going to be so disconnected that they won't even know what help is. And if they do help, the damage that they do with that help instead of helping isn't really – it doesn't offset all the damage that they did do in the process of making all that money. Uh, Esteban Lopez, she, you look good, my guy. Ah, uh, not when I look in the mirror, bro. I got, I got some work to do. This is not like, look at this. I got a bald spot on this side and then this side it's got hair. Why the fuck do I have a bald spot here? And subsequently, why does my cranium rotate this way? You guys see that? You guys see how this is retracted and this is protracted? Do you guys see that? Yeah. Why is that? <laughs> right? It's not good. I think this bald spot could be a, a a mile, maybe like I can't get the fucking hair to come out because I don't think it's that. It's probably some. It this probably has to do more with uh with stress than anything. But um yeah man like yeah I don't I don't think I have too many problems man. I got too many damn problems and um yeah and I wear them. And my my prior generations have had many problems. I'm just I try and keep it as real with myself as possible. Uh, but Esteban, I do appreciate the the morality boost there, bro. But. And I, I know I'm not the worst looking guy. I'm not the worst looking guy. I could be a lot better though. Jesus. I feel the same way, same way about marriage and kids. Uh, I think a lot of do pe people do uh, Braden Arnold. Uh, it's not, I, I wish it, I wish it would be cool. It would be cool to bring a kid into this world and be like, Hey, look, a functional society. I just, I think a lot of people feel that way. And I think in many ways this can be good, man. Um, I get a lot of times I told people I'm an advocate for depopulation and I am in an intelligent fashion, not one that involves massive amounts of, ge of genocide. It's just by people saying, maybe I'll just have one kid and I'll work within the confines of that so we can depopulate. So I've been for depopulation. It's just that people, when they hear the term depopulation and that somebody advocates for it, they think, oh my God, this guy's for genocide. I'm not for fucking genocide. I'm for just people making the, the conscious effort of saying, why do I really want kids? What's the purpose of that? If I bring a kid into this world, is it going to be, is he going to, he or she going to be a contributor? Are they going to be a detriment to society? That's the, that's the way that I'm looking at it. I'm not saying we depopulate by murdering people. That's obviously not the route that I want to take things. It's just people make a decision and say, is it, is it really going to be a contribution for me to have a kid? Because if you were living in, in, in times where, where we were living in tribes, when people lived in tribes, uh, you know, they had kids out of necessity oftentimes. And who knows, maybe people got banished because they had too many damn kids. And they and that's maybe how population increases happen. That's probably what it is. But I think at some point, people should have, or at some point we need to say, okay, are we having too many damn kids? Should we keep having kids? Is, is enough enough? So when I advocate for depopulation, I mean it that way. A lot of times they'll say it in a cynical tone where it's like, look at people are just fucking killing themselves. Look at how nonsensical what they do, uh, what, what they're doing is. You see this? They expect to get a good ha a good, uh, a good result out of this uh, differential advantage strategy that they have. But instead, what are they going to get? They're going to die. It's not going to be good. <laughs> it's not going to be good at all. So in that regard, like uh, – I advocate de depopulation in the sense that people should aim to uh, say, well, why are, why am I doing what I'm doing? Is it just to fulfill uh, an, uh, uh, it's, is it to satisfy my nostalgia of what I felt like when I was a kid and me to try and fulfill a delusion or am I trying to make a contribution here? And in general, I think it always comes back down to that is that anytime we do something, we should be thinking about making some kind of a contribution, no matter what it is. Uh, anyway, uh, next person. Try telling that to a Pilates teacher. I probably didn't get that one. I'll just look through ones. 
How do I address a protraction and retraction of the maxilla? Um, that's a complicated thing, man. I can't really give a clear answer. If you guys look up a gal named uh, Sarah Hornsby, she talks a lot about mouth posture and whatnot. Uh, look her up on Instagram under faceology, at faceology, and uh, you, she'll give you some insight as to how to like at least start getting on the path toward doing that. We do some things off, obviously with the cranium and mandible. Um, but bro, that's complicated stuff. Um, at the end of the day, it all it all ends up connecting into the body as well. There is again, FP is not a magic pill to anything. I'm trying to make it as much as possible, but it's not going to be a magic pill. But how do you address those uh, those issues? Um, I would say like look up uh, look up Sarah Hornsby. She's got some really good shit. She she talks specifically with regard to aspects of what go on the in the mouth, and that'll kind of give you more uh, information on that. And I don't I don't study into that. I study into it at an exterior level, but not very far. I will say that, um, for example, if you have like a cranial retraction, you're going to tend to have a pelvis protraction or an anterior pelvic shift or vice versa, but that won't account for cranial asymmetries. That could be some form of myofascial force transmission running through the, through the spiral lines that's twisting your cranium and then the, the part of your, of your spiral line twisting the cranium in the opposite direction and some of it just saying, okay, look, we're going to just contract and then we're going to create a fascial anchor here while the whole body – it gets really complicated. So um, that's why I just say uh, look up myofunctional therapy or just look up like Sarah Hornsby. She does some good things with regard to what you can do locally to help with that process. And then you can do other things to help with your, uh, with your mechanics and the rest of your body uh, with FP. I've been curious for the longest time. What, what is the device in your nostrils in your profile image? Um, that is called a V light. I don't really use it as much. I moved into a, to a warmer climate so I can just get, get it from the sun. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's infrared and near infrared light. You pretty much, I think, shoot it straight into your brain and it, um, it's like fuel to your brain. Uh, you're feeding the, the body infrared light. The body seems to like infrared light quite a bit. Also, is there a particular blue light, uh, brand of blue light blocking shades you prefer? Uh, we're in the process of making our, our own. Uh, we've, I, I have a, uh, one of our guys, he's, uh, very astute in the understanding of mathematics and physics. And he's, um, we're in the process of making some, uh, some really cool blue light blockers ourselves. So, uh, stay on the lookout for that. We'll have that here in the future. Uh, Bill Gates is an advocate for depopulation, providing vaccines to the third world countries that sterilize them. Yeah. I think if that, I don't know if it is doing that, but if it is doing that, it's fucked up. Um, at the same time, uh, pumped, you, you gotta see it this way. And I know, this is stuff that Bill Gates doesn't want to talk about in public, but I'll say it because it needs to be said. And I don't really give a shit what people think about it. But you have to see when you're in Bill Gates' situation, when you have employees and uh, and those employees have to manage employees and those employees have to manage employees and those employees have to manage employees who manage employees who manage employees. When you're at that level and you begin to see what's at the bottom of that uh, in terms of how people behave and how incapable they are of understanding the consequences of their decisions – then you, at some point you go, shit, even if I give these people the right information, will they, do they even have the skill sets or even the thought process to be able to overcome their problem? And I'm not saying I support this. I'm just saying this is the way Bill Gates probably thinks about the problem. He says, okay, well, this is the lowest end of what we have even in our company and even in our society. Now imagine you go to a third world country, which is even lower than that in terms of their capacity to understand the consequences of their decisions and how it impacts things on, on, in the world. And it's not to say that these people are bad. They just don't have an environment present uh, for them that's going to tell them, hey, man, like, look, this is the this is the they, they don't have the environment available to them to tell them, hey, man, these are the consequences of your decisions. They don't a lot of them can't even most of them can't even read. So at some point and these people are having kids like crazy, mind you, they're having kids like fucking crazy. And what what uh, Bill Gates is trying to do is do whatever he can to decrease that population or even educate people. People always say that, yeah, he's sterilizing them and whatnot with the needles. Uh, if you have links to that, I would like to see where that is specifically. And, and even if that's his intent, I'd like to see, so let me put it this way. He's also putting fertilizer into soil, fertilizer that's probably der a derivative of some kind of fossil fuel. But I don't see people complaining about that, but they'll complain about the sterilization. I could probably quantify to some degree that he's doing the fertilizer because he's well-intended because he's trying to feed people. I can probably, you might be able to quantify that he's doing these sterilizations the same way, but is he intending to do damage by doing this? I don't think he is. 
I don't think his intent is to do fucking damage. Is he part of the 1% trying to depopulate the fucking planet? Potentially. But what's – is he trying to do it in a sense in the way that you're saying it? Is he saying – is he do, doing it deviously? That's the question that I ask. So uh, Pumped, I would love to see what your response is to what I'm saying right now. I'm hoping you're still there because I'd like to hear a response because I've talked to other people who feel the same way about Bill Gates. So what I want to know is I want, to, I want you to substantiate the claims that Bill Gates – wants to murder people because that's kind of what people allude to when it comes to Bill Gates. Many people make those uh, accusations without really fully understanding even what he's, what he's about or what he's trying to do. And if, if you actually watch the interviews, it doesn't seem like he's trying to damage the world. What he's trying to do is develop the poor, the, the poor regions of the planet so that they are given opportunities to think more objectively. So then maybe then they'll have the, have the discussion within themselves to say, well, why am I going to bring that many more kids into this world? That's what it sounds like to me, uh, what he's trying to do. So pumped, if you could uh, respond to what I just stated right now, I would appreciate it. I think it would be good for us to have this dialogue right now. And I'll read it out in case people can't see it later, uh, because I think it would be um, it'd be good for people to get that kind of a response or see that kind of a response. So I'll, I'll maybe wait another uh, three or four minutes to see if uh, – or not even, maybe like one to two minutes and see if you respond. You may not even be here right now, so – I can't really see who's even here anyway. It's not like Facebook, unless I can see. Yeah, YouTube doesn't tell you who's watching you. Facebook can, so I, I can't see that you're here right now. So I'll give it about another 30, 40 seconds from right now, and then at that point, I'll, I'll kind of move on and, and close this video out. Nice, give me a time, some time to get a, a water break. Ed Freeman, I think you'd make a great father. I don't know, man. I don't know. Oh, that's a good point. Of course, people are speculating on his motives, myself included. Yeah, okay, well, that's, that's what I pumped a uh, road back. Um, again, we, what I think should be questioned isn't his motive. I think what should be questioned is his application. We should say, is... Bill, I don't think his motives are bad or wrong. I think his application is fucked up. I think that could be improved. And there's ways of going about that. And I think that's the question that society should ask. Is Bill Gates going about this the right way? We know we're, it's not that we have too many people on this planet, but if we look at the lifestyles that people have on this planet, um, it's not going to be sustainable. If we have 7 billion max, maximizing consumers dumping uh, CO2 into the environment, I think that's obvious. I think everybody can come to that to that recollection. I think it's clear that if we have 7 billion people all driving cars routinely consuming pounds and pounds and pounds of meat every day, consuming vegetables and just dumping pollution into the environment that we're not going to be in a good situation. I think everybody can conclude that. So the question is, how do we solve the problem? So I don't think that the question is what's Bill Gates mo Bill Gates, what's Bill Gates motive? I think he has a good motive. I think what should, we should question is what kind of fertilizer are you putting in the soil? What kind of vaccinations? What are the ingredients of these vaccinations that you're putting into these people? Um, statistically, what's the damage that's being induced by using these vaccinations on these people? Is it doing more good than bad? I would imagine it's probably doing more good than bad based upon the data that he's – and the metrics that he's got. But if you have metrics that showcase that he's doing it dysfunctionally, question him on that. Assume he's trying to do good, man, because I don't think anybody – I think our differential advantage uh, makes us do bad things, not because we want to do bad things, but because sometimes we feel like, you know what, we have no other choice. So at some level, um, I think that's where everybody is at in this world. I think everybody wants to do good. I think we all, I think a lion in nature wants to be peaceful. I think if it has a whole big fucking pile of meat and it's stuff, you could go over there and probably go, you probably can't go up to it and pet it, but you can probably go over there and chill next to it. If they have a bunch of food, eventually, and, and they don't have to hunt for their food, they'll eventually become domesticated. And I'll go over and say, and slap hands with the fucking lion, be like, what's up, dog? And they'll probably be slapping hands and chilling with me, right? That's what a lion would do. So I don't think biological or organisms are intentionally uh, nasty. I don't think that humans are intentionally bad. I just think that circumstances force them to make suboptimal decisions in particular circumstances that, that don't lead us towards a bad direction. So I don't think that Bill Gates is doing bad things intentionally. I think he has good intentions. The question, the, the criticisms that I would have for Bill Gates are, have you looked into this far enough to, to think about what the consequences are? Would it be better to have organic food than non-organic? Would it be better to educate these people on how to farm organically or to do permaculture 
Would it be better to do that? Obviously, yes. It would be much better to do those types of things. You would replenish the environment if we incorporated permaculture on massive scales. We would fix the entire damn planet. We would repair all the damage that we've done to the ecosystem if we all incorporated permaculture in mass quantities. So I would put it on, on uh, Bill Gates to say, hey, bro, this is where you're fucking up. Get people who are educated in permaculture to teach these people in Africa how to farm so that way we don't have to rely upon these fer fertilizers and pretty much destroy the topsoil that we're fucking that we so desperately need to maintain a healthy ecosystem. That's how I would go about it. So don't don't attack him and think that he's evil. Don't attack Jeff Bezos and assume that he's evil. You have to go about it in a different way. And if we do that as a, as, as a masses of saying, I don't think you're going about this right instead of saying, hey, you're a fucking Satan worshiping fucking terrible human when really at the at the end of the day, what all are you? You're a collection of eukaryotic cells that have mechanisms that tell you to duplicate and survive. That's what they tell you to do. You're not evil. You're just a responding organism to the environment. And we just say, look, bro, we don't think that you're responding correctly. You're not learning the lessons and you need to investigate deeper into what you're actually doing by putting fucking injecting sick people, which is what you're doing. You don't need to necessarily have the injections. There's ways, well, maybe there, there aren't better ways of dealing with malaria because I think malaria is going to kill you even if you're really healthy. Um, with that said, um, sometimes a vaccination is, is completely legitimate, right? Smallpox, I, from what I understand, and malaria have been controlled because of vaccinations. So it's not all bad either. So at some point, even if we say, well, he's using vaccinations, then we have to also say, well, what good what things have come that are good from vaccinations because plenty of things have been good. So we can't just think, okay, everything's some satanic bullshit. We can't just go down that path. Uh, anyway, you, you've responded. So let me, surely there's a better way to go about it. Boom. I didn't even have to fucking, you're already thinking the same way that I am pumped. Um, there's a lot of controversy surrounding the safety of vaccines in America, let alone the third world countries. There is a lot of controversy, bro. But at the same time, we also have to classify what part of vaccinations are good and which parts are bad. But if you're dumping chemicals into a baby, then at that point, I think we need to call into question how relevant uh, vaccinations are uh, to the degree that, of which we're using them. We need to quantify that, which these are all good discussions to be had. But if you're an you can't be anti-vaccine, man, because if you're anti-vaccine, you're anti-human. You are a fucking depopulation uh, supporter. Last time I checked, Ebola didn't spread. It didn't spread because there's people trying to do the right things to prevent that shit from happening. If the 1% wanted people to die in mass quantities, then guess what they would have done? They would have allowed Ebola to do what the fuck it was going to do. But, bro, people are well-intended. We all have to understand that. We're all well-intended. We just have circumstances that make us choose uh, less efficient paths in reality. We're always doing that. And, and we're never going to make the perfect choice. It's always a better choice. Is it a better choice, what we're doing? It's never going to be perfect. Anyway, guys, um, I do appreciate your time. Thank you guys for uh, popping and tuning in. If you did like this video and uh, you got some inf some good, useful insight out of it, please click like on it, share it with your friends, uh, spread the word. I think it's important stuff what I'm talking about here, and I think there's many people that could uh, that could gain from the perspectives that I'm sharing here. If you feel otherwise, by all means, uh, you guys can write comments and debate me or even make a video responding directly to a topic that I've put forth, and I will be more, more than happy to... Um, to respond and maybe i'm wrong and if you want to prove me wrong and 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 because you, if you it's not that you want to prove me wrong if you need to prove me wrong to update my perspectives have at it awesome i i would appreciate that so if there's something that i've said that's factually incorrect or whatever maybe i can have a discussion about that i have no uh, foibles with that shit. so at the end of the day i'm just trying to attain better health and if i'm more well informed about what's going on in reality uh, all that's going to do is help me so please click like share with your friends um Wish you guys all the best. Take care.